Take your Bible, if you will, and open to Matthew chapter 5 as we continue in our study of the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, we have been blessed by these four verses. Last week we looked at three of the verses uh, from chapter 5, verse 17, 18, and 19. And today we're going to close out those four verses with verse 20. Honestly, it's like drinking from an artesian well. Uh, the richness of the righteousness of Christ. If you know what an artesian well is, it's a natural well that does not require uh, a pump to bring the water up from deep in the earth. It actually is under pressure. And when you hit that artesian well, it just springs forth. The water just flows out naturally. And that's what God has given us naturally. Those who are under, who understand the work of the Holy Spirit and who are, are saved, you have received not by anything you've done, simply by the goodness of God, the gift of God, you've received his righteousness. So we're going to cover this this morning. Here in verse 17, though, let's just quickly go back and look at verse 17 again. Uh, Matthew 5, 17 through 20. Let me read the whole thing for you. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, unless until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. In verse 17, we learn that Jesus didn't come to change the law. He did not come to diminish the law. He did not come to advance the law beyond where it was. He's not an addition to the law. Jesus came to carry out the law. He came to carry out the law. In verse 18, we learned that everything that Jesus taught was in absolute, complete harmony with the Old Testament, with all of the Old Testament, with the prophets, with the psalmists, with every aspect of the Old Testament. Jesus never once diminishes the Old Testament. In fact, he taught from the Old Testament. In the book of Gospel of Matthew, he's speaking to the Jews. Uh, Matthew's appealing to the Jews, and Jesus often quotes the Old Testament. And so what does that mean for us? It means that we need to be just as committed in our study of the Old Testament as we are the New Testament. And many Christians, they somehow in their minds think that somehow the New Testament is the real deal. The Old Testament, that's old stuff. That was, you know, that's for those before us. But now we're in the New Testament. Let me tell you something. There's nothing new in the New Testament that is not in the Old Testament concealed. It's all part of, the, part of God's authoritative uh, word. Amen? And so we want to be faithful to both. To not be faithful to the Old Testament is to not agree with Christ. Jesus taught from the Old Testament. And then in verse 19, we see that God's Word is binding. It's binding on the lives of all men everywhere. Listen, Jesus said, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Today we will focus on verse 20, though, where Jesus teaches that the law of God has a purpose. You might ask, what is the purpose of the law from the Old Testament? What is the purpose of it? I'll tell you what its purpose is. Uh, by the way, that purpose has never changed. It was in the Old Testament, and it's in the New Testament. The, the purpose of the Old Testament has never changed. It's still the same today. And here it is. The purpose of the Old Testament law that God would show us what we have to be in terms of righteousness. And that level of righteousness that we have to be is far beyond anything we can do on our own. The Old Testament law shows us that we can never meet the righteous standard of a holy, perfect God. Never. 
The law teaches us that true righteousness is beyond our own reach. Okay? Now that sounds pretty disappointing. Some of you are like, my goodness, why am I here? If I can't attain the righteousness necessary to earn God's favor and his salvation, why am I here? Stay with me. We're going to explain that just as you'll never be able to live up to the law with your good deeds, with your abilities, with your own self-righteousness, yet God has a plan. Amen. He has a way. The law is doing its job to reveal to you that you are not righteous enough now or ever. But there is a plan of God whereby you come into the righteousness of God himself. That you, when God looks at you, he sees you as righteous as himself. Wow. Verse 20. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So what is it that gives you confidence that you are righteous in the eyes of God? Well, the Apostle Paul said that a day is coming when each of us will give account of himself to God. So, so what confidence do you have that you can stand before God, give an account with confidence that you are righteous enough? The law teaches us that if we trust in our own righteousness, we'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. We just read it. So Jesus shares a powerful parable to lay the foundation so that we can understand exactly what it takes for us to be made righteous. Let's look at that parable. Take your Bible, turn to Luke chapter 18. This is a passage that oftentimes is preached alongside the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, 17 through 20, because of what Jesus, what, what uh, Matthew says in the very beginning of the parable. Matthew starts the parable, verse 9, Luke 18. He also told this parable to some, here it is, who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. They trusted in themselves that they were righteous. And they treated other people with contempt. That's what happens when you walk around in a self-righteousness, when you're proud of what you do, what you are. I go to church, I sing the songs, I blah, 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 blah all that stuff. All about you and what you do. When you do that, what does it do? It makes you proud. It puffs you up. Now you look down on everyone around you. And that is the story of the Pharisees, if there ever was one. So let's read it if we can, this wonderful parable. It says in verse 10, Two men went up, Jesus said, Two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself. That's, that's a loaded uh, thought right there. You want to circle that in your Bible. <clears throat> he prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men. I'm different. I'm better. I'm a super person. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers. So what men is he referring to? Everybody else. They're a bunch of sinners. They're a bunch of thieves, extortioners. I'm nothing like them. Or even like this tax collector, this publican over here. I, speaking of himself, I fast twice a week. Well, whoop de do. This is he special. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. I don't tithe on, you know, what I take home. I tithe what, what I would take before the taxes are taken out. I am a special person. You see this guy putting all of his stock in himself. But the tax collector standing off, this guy he would not even lift his eyes to heaven. He was so ashamed of his sinfulness. He couldn't even look up. And he beats his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. 
Young men that are here today from Teen Challenge, we're so glad you're back. I couldn't think of a more appropriate message for you guys to hear on your first Sunday back with us. Because you're just getting started in life. And we're thrilled that you're here. But boy, please hear what Jesus is saying. Let me read that last verse again. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. The one who went away justified in this parable was the man who knew his righteousness could never lift him out of his sin. His confession that he was a sinner is what justified him. All that could justify him was saying, I am nothing, and there's nothing about me that is good. I don't rest on my laurels. I don't have anything in my life to point to that would somehow, in God's eyes, make me righteous. He had full understanding of one thing. I am a sinner. That's what he said. And the fact that he confessed that he's a sinner, God justified him. I'm going to judge. You can't justify yourself because you admit you're a sinner. I'm going to justify you. I just think that's an awesome thought. Confession of sin is the key to being justified by Christ. He, can't, he cannot save a person who thinks he's good because he came to die for sinners. What the law teaches us and what Jesus affirms is that there are no good people. No one is righteous. No, not one, Paul said. And if you allow the law to teach you that, uh, then, then, then you're going to be justified. Because the law is going to teach you that your righteousness will never, ever be good enough. So therefore, you take your eyes off of your ability, your goods, your merits, and you place your focus on the fact that you're nothing but a sinner. You have to go down in order for God to lift you up. That's what salvation is. It's surrender. It's letting go. I had an incident in my life. A number of years ago, I was a much younger guy, Bree uh, was home sick on a Saturday night and needed medication, so we knew that Albertsons down in Palm Beach Gardens, Albertsons will be open, they're open all night, so I said, honey, I'll go out and get you something. And it's probably 11 o'clock at night, and I head out the door, I go to Albertsons, I go to the pharmacy section, picked up the medicine off the shelf, and turned around, came to the register, and I'm paying for this medication, and I notice a policeman standing on the other side of the register. And I'm thinking, well, it's 11 o'clock at night. That's awesome that they have a policeman on duty helping tonight. And so I paid, and I started walking. I looked at him, hello. And then I walked through the door, got right outside the glass doors of the, of the Albertsons, and immediately he stopped me. He said, sir, can I talk to you? And I said, sure. And he said, uh, could you go ahead and just go up against this wall, put your hands on the wall? I want to, I want to, I'm what? And uh, the next thing I know, I, I see lights in the glass. It, actually, I was, this is, I'm leaning up against the part of, of Albertsons that's now the, the uh, uh, liquor store. You know, they have the entrance to the grocery store and the liquor store right now. And so here I am against the liquor store on Saturday night, 11 o'clock, in front of this preacher, you know. And now another police car pulls up, and now the lights are going. And I'm thinking, well, and I said, sir, what are you, what's going on? And he turned me around, and he said, sir, there's a lady inside the Albertson store upstairs and was looking over the store, and she said she identified you as the man that she came into the store with and that you had beat her. Oh. Oh. I'm telling you, if I was ever going to have a heart attack, that was what I would have. <laughs> And I, I said, sir, and he said, let me see your driver's license. I, I need to go up and ask her if you're the guy. And I'm thinking, I'm in serious trouble if this lady is a little bit out of her mind and just as angry and wants to blame it on me. I, I don't know this lady at all. I said, I just came from home. Call my wife. He's like, sir, give me your license. And so I realized in that moment, there's nothing that I can do to save myself. It comes down to this other woman. And thankfully, she said, he's not the guy. And I got to go home. <laughs> and I told the church about the next day. I said, in case you hear, <laughs> they all got a good laugh. 
out of my experience. I was not laughing at the time, but it came down to the fact that I had nothing. There was nothing I could have done to save myself. I could have been all off the jail that night. I'm telling you, there's nothing you can do to save you. And thank God you're not in the hands of a woman who's been abused. You're in the hands of a God who created you and loves you. And he's simply waiting for you to say, I am a sinner. Period. Stop it with all the things you've done for God. Stop it with all the money you've given to God. Stop it with your upbringing in the church. Stop it with your faithful attendance. Stop it with all the good things you do to people who are in need. Listen, none of that stuff will save you. None of it will make you righteous in God's eyes. So the law came with the purpose of showing us that the nicest, the most well-liked, the most benevolent, the most generous, the most religious people will be excluded from heaven if they had not placed their trust in the Lord's work, God's work, through Christ. You have to admit you're a sinner. There's no other way around it. That's why Paul said in Galatians 3.24, the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith, not by self, not by works. So the law came with the purpose of showing us that we're not good enough. Verse 24, I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the, and then he clearly calls out, this whole idea that Jesus only spoke such kind words to everybody, that is the biggest lie that's ever been given. All these folks who want Jesus to fit their profile for who he is, they want him to be this nice, sweet, pleasant, compassionate, merciful Jesus who never gets upset about anything, who never, ever speaks against anyone. You know, he follows the Bambi theory, you know. What did, what did the Bambi's mom teach Bambi, huh? Or Thumper, Thumper. It was the little rabbit in the Bambi movie. If you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. Well, Jesus never got that message when he was a little boy. I want you to see right here, he calls out the scribes and the Pharisees. If your righteousness does not exceed the righteousness of those who think they're the most righteous, you're not going to enter heaven. Forget it. The scribes were those who preserved and recorded the letter of the law. The scribe spent his entire life transferring the scripture from, from one papyrus to another, one letter at a time. They revered the Old Testament. They protected the Old Testament. That's the scribe. The person who was given the responsibility of protecting and preserving the Bible. Jesus said, if your righteousness is not better than his righteousness, you'll never hear him. And then the Pharisee, that was a particular set of Jews. Their original purpose was to protect the integrity of the law. But over time, they became very legalistic, very self-righteous. They took the law of God and they created their own laws from the law of God. Jesus called them human laws, human uh, uh, traditions. Instead of just sticking with the Mosaic law, sticking with the moral law of God, the Ten Commandments, they created 614 laws, or 13 laws, out of those laws. So they're creating their own righteousness. They made sure that that righteousness was a righteousness that they could live up to. In other words, here's God's standard. Well, we're going to create our own righteousness, and our standard will be here, and then therefore we can live it, and God will think that we're something special. At least the people will think that. The other thing about the Pharisees is everything they did was external, outside. There was no heart for God. There was no relationship, meaningful relationship. It was simply follow the external things that we do and let people see that, and blah, blah, blah. We're special, aren't we? When you can't meet the standard, what do you do? You lower it. You lower the standard. And that's what the Pharisees did. This was one of the distinguishing features of the Pharisees. They had this righteousness that was solely based on what people would see. So they wore these robes, long robes. They had these tassels. 
they had the phylactery and they would walk around and with their chest out and when somebody was walking along a sinner was walking along they would look at them like this and step way over here out of the way or if they're walking along and a person's walking up they expected the person to get out of their way why because we we have it all together we're the perfect ones we're the super uh, religious people you're not but Jesus said this. You talk about Jesus speaking the truth. See, he never, he never spoke against people to condemn people. He spoke against them to wake, awaken them that condemnation is coming. I want you to see this. Matthew 23, 25. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. He calls them, he calls them out hypocrites. He called them hypocrites. For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, by the outside things, but through faith in Christ, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. And these folks are saying, they're somehow coming in and they're trying to push this teaching that somehow, you know, by what they do and by what people see, they're going to be justified in the eyes of God. Because they're setting the standard. But you lowered the standard. God's not impressed with that. Those external works are all about doing things before God instead of worshiping God from a real relationship. Matthew 23, 23, Jesus calls them out and says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe, mint, and dill, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You're doing all the things that are easy, but you're not living from your heart in a way that is keeping with the law of God. And of course, you can't live in such a way to please and keep the law of God. But they found a way to do it, they thought. Mark 6, 7, Jesus said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. It would be a Christian today who dresses nice, they come to church, they sing the songs, they talk the talk, you know, the Christian lingo. They, seem to, they go into a restaurant and they come in with this little bit of an air and they look at people over here who maybe somebody comes in, this guy's a drunk, and he's just slouched over in his, in his uh, chili, you know, I mean, he's just in a bad place. And they're like, oh, 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 I can't believe it. You're a Pharisee. The reality is, whether you're a drunk stooped over in your chili, or whether you're a person wearing nice clothes and saying the right things and looking the part, you're both dying and going to hell apart from the work of Christ. And if Christ has done a work in your heart, you'd never look down at that other person. Those who have been forgiven much, forget much. Those who have received mercy, show mercy. This is what Jesus is trying to get to with us. Don't be like the Pharisees and scribes. They put all their effort, all their energy in looking the part. And I'm telling you, none of that matters to God. You're no better off than the person sitting in church looking sharp or the person who's out running around as a drunk. doesn't matter. You can be an adulterer. You're in the same category as a, Christian, as a person who has put their faith and their hope in righteousness of self. You're in the same category. They also misrepresented God's law. Instead of recognizing the purpose of the law to reveal that they could not keep it, leading to repentance and salvation, they took the other route and weakened the law so that they could keep it. What they did was they created a false way of salvation, which in reality produces death and corruption and destruction. We too have to be careful that we not create our own rules of righteousness. It's easy to say, well, here's what this passage means to me in Bible study. Well, here's how I interpret that. It doesn't matter what you think it means to you. What matters when you study the Word is what does it mean to God? What is God saying to us? That protects you from a self-righteousness. See, God's Word is immutable. There's only one meaning, and that meaning is coming from God, not from man. We're, we're here to try to understand God's opinion on the Word of God, not our opinion. 
Remember, the purpose of the law is to show us that we are incapable of being righteous enough on our own merit. It points us to a position of unrighteousness before God, not righteousness. So what does it matter what your opinion is? Well, my, my, my thought, man, here's, my, here's what I've always thought. This is what I was taught. That's arrogance. You're putting what you were taught up against what God means? Nobody in their right mind would do that. And so we can easily get there and not even know it. We're walking ignorantly to the righteousness of God. We have to be careful that when we approach the Word of God, Old and New Testament, that we approach it with this humble heart. Lord, if it weren't for you, I would not be saved, and the Holy Spirit would not be in me, and I wouldn't be able to understand this Bible and what you're trying to say to me. It does not matter what people say. Listen, I'll tell you something. Relationships with people. There, you can be a person who has the best relationship. You've got the best personality. Everybody likes you. You have the favor of man and not have the favor of God if you're not living according to the Word of God. If you've not made the righteousness of Christ your focus in life. If you're putting your hope in yourself in any way, shape, or form, you're missing it. Isaiah 64, 6 says, We have all become like the one who was unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind take us away. That was the Pharisees. They thought that they were clean and they were righteous because of their good works, and that they wore white garments. But Jesus told them that you're sons of the devil. It's all you are. You're, you're, you're children of lies. You're living a lie. And if you're going to, if you don't confess that you're a liar, I can never save you. Like the parable Jesus told, this parable Pharisee says, I thank God I'm not like the sinner over there. See, they, they met their own standard. Now, Jesus reinforces the purpose of the law in Matthew 5, verse 48. Just a little further in our same chapter, he says this. You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Well, talk about raising the bar. you got to be perfect like God is perfect. That's, it. That's the only person God will justify. That's the only person who can say, if you're perfect, like your Father in heaven is perfect. Whoa. So how in the world does a person get the full benefit of the law and find justification before a perfect, holy, and righteous God. Well, Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. It says, Yet we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law. We already looked at that, but now the second half. But through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Jesus Christ in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because the works of the law, no one will be justified. How are we justified? By faith in Christ. Christ. Faith in Christ. Romans 3.21, but now the righteousness of God has been manifest apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. If you're going to be saved, you have to come through Jesus Christ. Listen, you have to come through the law. The one who carried out the law. You still have to be perfect like God is perfect to be saved. That never was lifted, even though Christ come. This, this idea that now it's just a grace message, and we don't need to worry about the law at all. That is foolishness to think that. God never ended the law. Christ did not say that he was ending the law or that he was going to become something other than the law. He came to carry out the Old Testament law through his own body, his own life, his own death, his own suffering. He did all of that for you and I. Our righteousness comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Who went to the cross? By the way, on the cross, Jesus, while he, while God put sin on him, God saw him as sin. Jesus himself on the cross never sinned. Some people think that he was a sinner. He was not a sinner. He, he was only the perfect, holy righteousness of God, even on the cross. But God laid on him. The sinfulness, the unrighteousness, the wickedness of man. And Christ died. So that the righteousness of Christ could be laid on us. 
bunch of sinners. What a wonderful exchange. That Christ took on my sin so that I could take on his righteousness. So that when God the Father looks at me, he sees holy, perfect righteousness. Praise God. It's interesting, Romans chapter 4, verse 3, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him, or credited to him, as righteousness. How could the righteousness of God, that's holy and perfect, be credited to Abraham, who was a sinner? And remember, Abraham committed a lot of sins. He goes into account with his, with his wife and says, tell the king if you're my sister, that I don't want to die. If he thinks you're beautiful, as he will, uh, then he'll have me put out the bastard uh, so he can have you. He lied. He didn't have the faith to trust that God would bring him and his wife through that kingdom. He did that over and over. Abraham had all kinds of issues. But now the Bible says that it's been credited to Abraham as righteousness. What has been credited? His faith in Jesus Christ, not his good work, because he didn't have them. He's fact, in fact, in Hebrews 11, he's known as the father of faith. He's the patriarch that it all started. He believed God. He trusted God. God said, "Take, leave your people, leave your money, leave your pastors, and go where I'm leading you on a raise the nation for you. He had no clue where he was going. He just took off walking. God didn't give him a final destination. There was no GPS. Okay, you'll get to this point, you know, in, 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 in three months. He just started walking by faith. That's why. Abraham was credited the righteousness of God, even though Christ had not yet done the cross. God went ahead and knew because of his faith he would believe he gave him that righteousness. Isn't that wonderful? You can't earn righteousness. It's a gift. Please turn in your Bible. Please turn in your Bible to 5, Romans 5, 17. Because I want you to see this. I want you to underline it in your Bible. You need to remember this verse. When we talk about righteousness, and God's righteousness is only one way to attain the righteousness of God. Here it is. Romans 5, 17. We're closing down. But we're just getting into the end here where we, we give you the opportunity to receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ by faith. Romans 5, 17. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man. Who was that one man? Adam. Because Adam sinned, all men and women on the earth have sinned. Much more will those who receive the abundance of grace, and here it is, the free gift of righteousness, reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Now I want you to see what I just read. See, we always say, well, my salvation is a gift. It's a gift of God, and you're absolutely right. Did you know that the pure, holy righteousness of God is also a gift to you? It's not by going to church. It's not by doing good things that you are righteous. Your righteousness is as filthy rags in His sight, Isaiah said. The way that you receive or attain or assign or are imputed the righteousness of Christ is because it's a free gift. Nothing you can do to earn righteousness. It's a free gift. That's what this, that passage says. Free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man who is right. See, Abraham was credited righteousness because it's a free gift. He didn't receive the righteousness as an exchange for good works that he had done. God's righteousness could never be earned. What would it, what would it take to earn the righteousness of God, by the way? You would have to be as perfect as God is. Sorry, you lose. <laughs> The only way to experience the righteousness of God is if He gives it to you. He gifts it to you. And that's exactly what He did through the work of Christ on the cross. It's the only way to heaven, folks. Jesus Christ has to assign. He has to impute His righteousness to you. Romans 5.21 says, So that as sin, death, reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is no other way on this earth. There is no world religion that you can follow that will give you the righteousness that appeases God. None. John 14, 1 says, Jesus, right before he ascends and leaves his, his uh, disciples, 
He said, right before he went to the cross, he said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Why? Why would he say believe in God believe also in me? Because I'm God. I'm the second person of the Trinity. I created all things, and in, in me all things are held together. And then he says this, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, will I not come again and will uh, take you to myself that where I am, there you might be also? And you know the way where I'm going, he said. He's speaking to his disciples. You know where I'm going. I'm about to leave. I'm going to die on the cross. I'm going to impute my righteousness to you. And you will. I'm going up to prepare the place that you're coming to. And you know the way where I'm going. Well, Thomas said, Lord, we do not know where you're going. So how is it possible that we can know the way? And Jesus said to Thomas, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father except through me. No one who spends their entire life on this earth doing good for others. You can be as good in earthly standards as Mother Teresa and go to hell. If Mother Teresa did not place her, her life in the hands of Jesus Christ, if she did not receive his imputed righteousness over all her good works, she is not in heaven. And neither will you be. He says, I am the way, the truth, life. No one comes to the Father except through me. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, And because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Jesus has everything you need to live in this world and the one to come. Have you placed your trust in your own righteousness, in your own good works? Or have you placed totally your trust in in Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for your sins. Again, how good does a person have to be to get to heaven? As good as God. How do you get to be as good as God? Only by being assigned God's righteousness. How does God give you His righteousness? How does He assign it? When you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. The Bible says the righteousness of Christ is to you. So this morning, if you're here and you have been living your life trying to be good, trying to do what's right, trying to live a moral life, wonderful. You're better than a lot of folks. But you're nowhere close to being good enough in the eyes of God. It's not based on anything that you do or think. It's solely based on your ability to recognize what the Old Testament has been trying to teach. That you'll never be good enough. Therefore, be like the tax collector who goes to temple, who can't even lift his eyes to heaven because of the guilt and the shame of his sinfulness. And he beats his chest and cries out, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. When you take that position, God is able to save you. He can impute to you righteousness. And here's what it looks like. It's simple as this. You receive Christ today. Just receive Him as the Son of God who died for you. Confess you're a sinner. The Bible says He's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. So then what happens after He cleanses you of unrighteousness? He imputes by the Holy Spirit. He regenerates your spirit. Now, you carry the righteousness of God in you. Here's what that means. You came in today believing in yourself, trusting in your own good, good works. But you place your faith in Christ. You leave today with God the Father who's holy and perfect in His righteousness, looking down at you and seeing the righteousness of His Son fully covering you so that it's as if from God the Father's perspective you've never 
sin. We live in a world that's quite cynical. Many of us in this room are harder on ourselves than the world could ever be. I'm telling you there's a way out of all that. Receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and immediately be justified in the eyes of God where now he sees you as never having sinned. That's why Paul addressed all of his letters to the churches and he said to the saints in Ephesus, to the saints in Galatia, to the saints in Philippi. He called them saints. Don't think of saint in the terms that man has used, where man lifts up certain individuals and makes statues out of them. That's not what Paul was referring to. Paul was saying, you're not a saint because you did good things on the earth. That's what others have said. These are special people, so we're going to make a statue because they did special things. Paul says, no, no, that's not what you're a saint. You're a saint because God sees his righteousness covering your sinfulness. You're a saint. It's the last time you thought about yourself as a saint instead of a sinner. But you can't think of yourself as a saint until you admit that you're a sinner. <laughs> when you see yourself as a sinner, now you become a saint. When you confess your sin and receive Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, this morning, we have been challenged from your word to understand the Old Testament, the purpose of it, to understand righteousness, not only from God's standard, but also man's standard. For the one today who admits, like the publican, like the tax collector, God, be merciful to me. I am a sinner. Jesus, you said that person that admits that today, that believes that you are the Son of God, he walks away justified. Oh, may there be many that are justified today in this place. May they see themselves the way you see them. That you look at them like they've never sinned. And you love them. And even though they're going to fall short, that's why you gave us grace. You didn't just die on the cross for the past sins that we committed and now we have to live perfect lives in the future. You died for every sin we've ever committed or ever will commit. Past, present, future. We've been covered by the righteousness of Christ, by the grace of God. We live every day as children of God, as members of the kingdom of heaven. Thank you, God, that we have righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit who resides in our hearts. Thank you, Father. Amen. If you would like to have prayer over any matter in your life that might have nothing to do with the message today, we're going to have some of our prayer partners spread out so that you're not too close. And just come and talk with one of them. They'll be more than happy to just agree with you in prayer. Sometimes it's just nice to know that you're not alone in what you're facing or you're not alone in the burden you're carrying for a loved one. Bring it to one of these that they might be able to pray with you, okay? That's real important. So feel free to step out and come up right now. If you receive Christ today, you pray, you confess that you were a sinner, and you received him, I would love for you, if you would, to let us know about that. You can walk up to any one of these folks and tell them. We'd like to just be able to come alongside you. This is a church that's committed to discipling people. Every one of you are on a journey with God, and every one of you are called to be disciples. So we want to be about disciple making, disciple training, and disciple empowering. Who knows how God's going to use you. But you've now started the journey if you're saved. And now let us walk along with you and encourage you as you go with God. Amen? Amen. All right. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm going to release you now. Please take time to fellowship. It's so important. Uh, and then come if you need help about any matter.